Okay, well, thank you everybody uh, for taking time out of your schedules to join us and find out about the new and exciting features uh, in EAST uh, 6.5. Uh, I am Pantelis Vlahos, and I'm a biostatistician in the CITEL offices in uh, Geneva. And I will be presenting the first half of today's uh, presentation, going through uh, the methods that are behind the enhancements that we have added into EAST. Um, I will go initially in um, and in transition from East 6.4 to 6.5, telling you about what has been added, uh, what's different between the two versions, the three new modules that we have added, uh, while my colleague Charles will also refer to uh, some further enhancements uh, in addition to providing you with a demo of the software. So going into East 6.4, this is the current version of our software for which I'm sure that quite a few of you are already familiar with. Uh, and this is the structure of the modules uh, currently in uh, E6.4. Within each one of these modules, there are enhancements that uh, Charles will go over um, towards the end of today's presentation. But the focus uh, of today's presentation is going to be three new modules uh, that we have added. Um, one having to do with population enrichment, one with program level design and uh, MCP mod. So let's begin uh, by going first into the MCP mod uh, module, which deals in general with dose response studies. Um, the goals of these studies is to establish proof of concept and see basically how a change in the dose results in a desirable change in the endpoint of interest. And the second goal is a dose finding step is one that uh, tries to select one or maybe more than one good dose levels so that it can be passed over for a confirmatory phase three trial once uh, proof of concept has been established. Um, the current approach, the traditional approach, um, does this in two separate steps. So the proof of concept is conducted using multiple active, active arms and placebo. You have the selection of the target dose, which is statistically significant dose at the proof of concept stage, and actually the, picking up the smallest of such doses, uh, but also the one that is clinically relevant. In the dose response modeling step, uh, data that have resulted from the proof of concept step and from earlier trials are being used, and a statistical model that captures the effects of the target dose of the dose response uh, is being utilized. So this is uh, a straightforward approach. It has some drawbacks. Uh, however, and mostly the drawbacks have to do with the fact that uh, this method tends to concentrate the range of doses studied to a narrow range where the sponsors can have faith that they will establish a clear dose signal. Um, it is um, also it's clear that the dose response model should itself play a greater role in choosing uh, the right dose. But, however, with the current approach, uh, the dose response uh, modeling comes in at the very end of the process, and a much better approach would be to try and design the trial with possible statistical models uh, in mind. So for that, the MCP mod uh, methodology has uh, been developed and has been around uh, for quite some time, and it consists of two um, separate uh, components. If you view them individually, these components, the MCP component basically treats those as a qualitative factor, and then proceeds in making inference about the target dose restricted to this discrete set of doses that he used uh, the trial. On the other hand, the mod component uses a parametric functional relationship to model the relationship between dose and response. In other words, it treats dose as a quantitative factor, and the validity of the modeling approach depends on pre-specifying appropriate those response models. So these two components with the MCP methodology are actually being put together, okay? And they construct the uh, MCP mod methodology. The difference, uh, I'll, I'll be explaining essentially the difference in the traditional pairwise comparisons by this use of the dose response modeling. So at the design stage, we have a pre-specification of candidate dose uh, response models. Each of these dose response 
shapes in that candidate set is going to be tested using appropriate contrasts and employing uh, MCP techniques, model uh, uh, comparison technique, uh, multiple comparison techniques that will preserve uh, the type one error. Now, proof of concept is going to be established when at least one of the model tests is going to be significant. And once this proof of concept uh, is established, either a best model, single best model, model, or a weighted average of a set of significant models is going to be used to estimate the dose response profile and the target dose of interest. So, in other words, MCP mod uh, combines multiple comparison and model based approaches. It tends to be robust to model mystification and it is quite flexible in dose estimation. So, it results overall in more informative designs. Uh, and which form a more a solid basis for a confirmatory study, and they have been endorsed uh, by the two major uh, regulator agencies. This is MCP mod is not new um, to Cytel and to our products. Uh, for the analysis part of the software, Cytel has intro already introduced a couple of years ago PROC MCP mod, uh, which is already available uh, in the SAS platform. What you will find in E6.5 is this new module that, besides analysis, it also includes the design, where you also have sample size and power, which are pro uh, produced individually for each candidate model, but also in some uh, summarized fashion. This design can be based on optimal allocation, and it is currently available for normal binomial uh, and count uh, endpoints. So this is the first. Uh, of the three enhancements uh, that we have made for software. Uh, the second one has to do with um, uh, population enrichment, in particular adaptive population enrichment. Uh, I'm going to be using uh, a motivating example uh, for this uh, just to um, provide the setup for the method that's currently being implemented uh, within East. So angiosarcoma is an ultra ultra disease. Uh, it has been poorly addressed by current treatments. Azopanib is a VGF inhibitor that shows modest benefit, but uh, TRC-105 can actually complement Azopanib by inhibiting and doubling, which is a different angiogenic uh, target. An adaptive trial is considered to be optimal uh, for this type of uh, case because this refers to a small population. We have about 1,800 cases a year. We have limited prior data. And for this particular case, there seems to be subgroup interaction because there appears to be a greater benefit possible for the addition of TRC-105 to pasopanib for cutaneous versus visceral uh, tumors. So the type of design that has been employed uh, in such a situation is the following that you see here and which I'm going to try to explain um, in, the, in the graph that you see in front of you. So, um, we have an interim analysis. So first of all, we have the enrollment in two cohorts that will be done uh, in sequential uh, manner. So accrual in the second cohort will only start after the first cohort accrual is going to be over. So the interim analysis uh, that we have here is going to be based on patients from the first cohort only. Okay, the first cohort, these are patients, uh, all comers, um, who have been uh, obviously randomized in either pasopanib alone and pasopanib plus the addition of TRC-105. Now, if the treatment shows significant improvement uh, than the standard of care into the full population, so if we are up here, both in the subgroup and in the complement of the subgroup, no changes should be done to the trial. The second cohort will recruit the pre-specified number of subjects from both the subgroup and the complement. And then the trial will end when the required number of events from the two cohorts are going to be observed. One can think of this scenario as, um, the, uh, as um, the full population as being uh, in a favorable zone. So this, this entire design can be thought as an extension of the, the current sample size re-estimation procedure that is already available in East, uh, which is done based on the promising zone methodology. Now, uh, if the treatment uh, does not show significant improvement 
but shows promising improvements when compared to the standard of care, then you can increase the sample size for the second cohort. Um, again, the second cohort will include patients from the full population, and users should actually modify just the study duration in case uh, of treatment is promising in the full population. So in that situation, we are in this uh, part. Now, let's go to the further down. If the treatment is not doing better than the uh, standard of care in the full population, okay, uh, but it's only doing better in the positive subgroup, then the new treatment is performing well well. This means that there is a clear interaction between the biomarker positive group and the new treatment, and therefore, for the second cohort, we will only recruit patients with the positive biomarker only. Okay? So this scenario is when the full population is unfavorable, but the subpopulation, the biomarker uh, positive subject, is favorable or promising. Um, the last scenario will be when the treatment does not work in the full population as well as the positive uh, population. This is the case when the new treatment is unfavorable in both uh, full population as well uh, as uh, the subgroup. And we also have an option to stop uh, for fertility in case um, results are um, not uh, are beyond uh, a threshold for a fertility topic. So this is the, the adaptive study. As you can see, there are two, uh, as we mentioned, there are two cohorts. It's a two-stage design, so there's going to be a p-value from the data from cohort one. There's a p-value resulting from the data from cohort two. And we're going to be ensuring that um, type one error is going to be preserved by performing um, uh, closed testing. So the closed testing uses, obviously, a combination function and a condition on the combination function, whether we are actually in the case of no enrichment or whether we are in the case uh, of enrichment. So these particular designs are available in E6.5 for time to event endpoints. Um, with time to event endpoints, we also have some special challenges because uh, in order for this methodology to work, you need to have independence between uh, the p-values in the two stages, between p1 and p2. Uh, as, but uh, for, we cannot use auxiliary data in the sense of observations of cohort 1 that become completed in cohort 2 uh, because using auxiliary data essentially destroys the independence of p1 and p2. And this has been demonstrated uh, in the literature. So instead of choosing the interim analysis time point to split, split the data in cohort one and cohort two, what needs to be done is to pre-specify the allocation of the events and the sample size to each cohort before taking the interim analysis. So for example, as an example here, you can specify that cohort one is going to be 70 patients and 60 events. Uh, the interim analysis is going to be taken after four events have arrived, and cohort two is going to contain 54 subjects um, corresponding to 35 events. This allows for a full inspection of all cohort 1 data the interim analysis, including uh, the sensor observations. And this is evaluated through simulation. This is a simulation-based uh, approach, which means that you will get to tune um, your design by selecting different options, different combinations of patients and events for uh, the cohorts, as well as the, the, the point at which uh, the interim analysis is going to be taken. So to conclude and to recap the type of the design, we have initially the enrollment of subjects in the full population. We have the interim look. We can either proceed according to the favorable zone in the uh, an unblanked sample size re-estimation um, uh, setup where, where we are in the favorable zone and there's no change in the second cohort. If we have promising results, we proceed with a sample size increase in the full cohort. And if we are in the unfavorable zone, we can either um, fall in unfavorable for both the, the subpopulation and the full sample size, which means that we cannot perform any change in the second cohort. Or if we are favorable with respect to the uh, subgroup, then we can um, increase uh, the participation of the subjects from uh, the subgroup only. So this is uh, the second module that has been added, and uh, my colleague will actually, Charles, in the 
um, second half, we'll also present you with uh, more uh, uh, a demonstration and more options on how uh, this is actually being implemented uh, in East and what the output looks like. Um, in the third and final uh, module that we have added, um, we are dealing with uh, program design. 